Brown. I am a professor of political science here at Rowan State. I also teach history classes and I'm a service learning coordinator. So appreciate everybody coming out. And I've been sort of studying the Constitution for a long time. And so I'm going to try to give you just like a broad overview of the Constitution, what it is, why we have it, what it seeks to do. Um, I want to start out by saying I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to give you any legal interpretations or advice or anything like that. I'm mostly just going to cover the history and politics of it. Um, Constitution? How so? 
Yep, fourth amendment, which we'll get to. So this was angered some people in the colonies. This alone isn't going to lead to a revolution. None of these single things is, but all together they are, they are going to. And one of the strongest critics of this was a guy named John Adams, who you might have heard of. Uh, another thing was a sort of a culture clash that happened between the British and the colonists, the British officer class, um, as you probably know. What class do you think they typically came from? If you're an officer in the upper. the upper class, you're an officer in the British military, probably your father was also an officer in the British military and his father back generations. So you probably come from a pretty relatively, I guess, I wouldn't say easy, but relatively privileged background. You probably had well educated and things like that. Your average raw recruit from Virginia or Pennsylvania, what do you think? Not so much. So they don't necessarily get along with each other. Um, the officers see the uh, see the recruits as very raw and irresponsible and whatnot. The recruits see the officers as elitist and out of touch, so that they don't necessarily get along. Um, of course, after the war is over, the British win which is good for them. But, do you know war is expensive? So, they're all now broke because of it. So, what do they have to do? Tax. Tax. Well, they have to, have to come up with money, revenue somehow, and obviously the usual way is through taxes. And so, they began imposing taxes on the colonies. Um, Sugar Act, Stamp Act, Townsend Act, not all these were necessarily taxes. Some of them were um, just rules, laws that were imposed on the colonies. All these were done without any sort of consultation of the colonial leaders themselves, though. So what angers the colonists is the taxes, but also the fact that they aren't being consulted at all. The mother country across the ocean is just deciding this is what you're going to do. So you're going to you're going to do it, and so many colonial leaders were not happy about this. They felt they weren't being respected; their rights weren't being respected, and so they began pushing back against this um, through peaceful protests and through, at times, violence. Um, things like the Boston Massacre, Boston Tea Party. What was the Boston Massacre? Anybody know? So basically, there's a famous painting by Paul Revere, which actually probably should be on the this engine. There you go. So, a bunch of red coats just mowed down a bunch of civilians, right? Is that how it actually? No, not exactly. So, yeah, what's that? The British soldiers, because they wear red coats. So, the, um, what happened was, well, there had been, I don't want to go, I won't spend too much time on this, but basically there had been protests which had, gotten unruly and a group of large group, hundreds of protesters, some of them were taunting and provoking some British soldiers and assaulting them, throwing rocks and blocks of ice at them, and one of them got knocked down and he fired his rifle and shots were fired. When you hear the term massacre, how many people do you think of dying? Hundreds. How many actually died in the Boston? Was John was the one the one year old child? What's that? The one year old child. Uh, well, he, that was before. Before I sort of skip over that. But that was one of the reasons that. That was, that was the catalyst. Yeah, everybody. That's one of the reasons the like there was so much anger among the colonists because, and that hadn't exactly been 
so black and white either. It had been a situation where a mob of protesters had shown up outside of the governor's, colonial governor's home and were throwing rocks at it. One of them would get his wife and knock, broke a window and get his wife and knocked her down. So he loaded his rifle with birdshot and fired and probably didn't intend to kill anybody, but he did. His birdshot struck the 11 year old. And both these things are incidents that you can interpret in different ways depending on where you're starting from. Um, like today, I mean, if you watch the news today, confirmation bias is a thing. In the real world, it's pretty rare that you have a situation where everybody, one side does everything exactly perfectly, the other side does everything exactly wrong. Very rare, so usually there's enough that you can see, understand how people react as they do to a situation on either side. So whichever side you're predisposed to be on, you're going to see it from their point of view, right? Which is why today, two different people can see the same event and they'll just see it as more evidence for what they already believe, even if they believe the exact opposite things. So that's how it worked here. Um, reality is in both of these situations, there's not really, it's not black and white. Um, there were, nobody is really evil here. You have some people that on both sides that did some things wrong for sure, but you can sort of again understand if you look at it from a point of view why they did. Because you know, in the real world, when, when it hits the fan, people don't usually go completely by the book, right? Ironically, wasn't it John Adams that would represent them at court? Yep. John Adams was their defense attorney for the soldiers in the Boston Massacre, even though he was one of the strongest advocates for colonial rights. His view was, we're a nation of laws. It doesn't matter if we like these people or not. They're entitled to a fair trial just as anyone else is. And uh, by serving as their attorney, I will ensure that they get one. And by all accounts, they did because they were all, I think all the two of them were acquitted. The two that were convicted were, though, really convicted on very minor charges and got a, like a brand on their thumb. So, essentially, they got off, I could say. So, all right. So, and then the Boston Tea Party, this was the uh, protest. The uh, colonists decided to boycott British tea, so the British couldn't have that. So they tried to basically force um, British tea to be processed through the Customs House in Boston. And there's a standoff. Time was kind of on the British, British side on this, though, because if stuff in the wall of time was that things didn't clear customs within, I think it was 20 days, it would be auctioned off to the public. So if they refused to process this, it was sit out here in Boston Harbor and wait for 20 days, and then the law says basically we'll win by default at that point. So to prevent that from happening, John Adams, Sam Adams, and some others dressed up as Mohawk Indians for symbolized American innocence and virtue and all that, went on to the ship, actually Sam Adams, not John Adams, Sam Adams, John Adams probably would have done that, uh, went on the ship and took the tea and dumped it in the harbor. At this point though, both the British and the Colonials are pretty hardened into their positions. They aren't, it's not really about tea anymore. Just like, again, in our politics today, people get super divided over trivial stuff. It's not really that specific issue that's dividing them. It's a problem. So, the um, colonies hold the first Continental Congress to. Uh, to try to organize, to try to fight back against this. But pretty soon, things are going to turn more violent. Um, they send the, for the Second Continental Congress sends what becomes known as the Olive Branch Petition to George III, asking him to intervene on their behalf. But they also establish a army to defend themselves. Of course, this is seen as an act of war by the British. And we get skirmishes at Lexington and Concord, sort of the first shots of the 
Revolutionary War fired uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson in 1837, would have called this the shot turned around the world. Um, the colonials, the patriots win because they had spies who told them the British were coming, so they were prepared. Um, so Richard Henry Lee introduces a resolution declaring the colonies free in Britain. This resolution, not have heard of? Declaration. What is it? Declaration of Independence, which was written by who? Jefferson. Jefferson, right. With, well, a committee of five people were good being to write it. Three of them you've heard of, two of them probably haven't. I can't remember the other two's names. Um, but the three you've heard of are Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and John Adams. Franklin was the obvious choice to write it because he was the senior elder statesman at this point, and he was famous in Europe because of his scientific experiments, most famous man in the colonies. But he declined because he didn't want to write something that would be subject to review by committee. So then it fell to Adams, and Adams deferred to Jefferson as well. And he would, because he felt Jefferson would carry more credibility. And this is something that Adams is never going to fail to remind anyone for the rest of his life that he could have written a declaration of independence when he suggested Jefferson. Just like he's never going to forget to remind anyone that it was him who suggested Washington be named head commander in chief of the Continental Army. Alright, so a declaration of independence, primarily it's a list of grievances against the British, but also includes many ideals of what the United States should be. Like most famous passage in the Declaration of Independence would be one. I bet some of you haven't memorized. That's the beginning. Yeah, that, okay, that's true. The next one is why we went for that. Equality. We hold these yeah, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they're endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable <laughs> rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So. Of course, Jefferson wrote that. It's a little ironic that he did. Slave owner. Because he owned slaves. All the sold people and slaves. So. But uh, we'll talk about that later. People are complicated. Okay, so we're fighting the war now, so against the greatest empire in the world, we better get organized. And so we create a new document. Well, yeah, a new document. For a for these United States of America, and it is not the Constitution we have now. It is the Constitution 1.0, the Articles of Confederation. And so, under the British, we learned that too much centralized power can be dangerous, right? So, as humans typically do, we overcorrect for this, and we go over the exact far as we can in the opposite and create a new central government that has almost no power. Um, formally, this established the United States of America. And there's a whole lot of people who will argue pedantically about who the first president was. But the United States began on July 4, 1776. It began with the ratification of the Constitution. If it began with the ratification of the Constitution, then this is not the United States. But, you know what? It doesn't matter. Yeah. Weren't there like, I don't know what they called it exactly, there were like 10 different leaders in that span of the 40 months? Yeah. The uh, Continental Congress elected a president. And so you could argue, and I can't remember the person's name, but you could argue that was actually the first president. I think John Hancock was one of the first president. Yeah. He might have been the first one, I can't remember. But, but, you know, Arnold's Confederation didn't really work out. Um, it established a league of friendship, as it was called, but had no president. Each state had was well, each state had one vote, regardless of population. And to amend the articles, you had to have unanimous consent of all the states. So you could, a vote could be twelve to one, but it would still fail because you need all thirteen to sign on. So it didn't have any power to raise revenue either. It could only request revenue from the states. How well is this going to work? 
Well, seemingly, at least to some, it worked pretty well for a while. Um, some of the founders, Alexander Hamilton most prominently, but Madison, Jay, some others, all didn't like this basically from the start because they felt that there was not enough centralized power. Hamilton especially is going to be more of an advocate of a stronger national government. So he calls for a convention to be held in Annapolis, Maryland in 1786 to discuss how these articles can be revised, how we can strengthen them, make them more effective in his view. But only five states even send representatives to this convention. So obviously you can deduce from that that most states didn't really have a problem with them as they were. But something's going to happen to change that, that fall, 1786, and that's going to be a rebellion in Massachusetts. Daniel Shays had been a, was a veteran of the Revolutionary War, served in the Continental Army, and he, along with some other farmers in western Massachusetts, were mad because the government in Massachusetts had raised their taxes to the point that they couldn't pay their mortgages on their farms. And so Shays' view was, we fought a war over taxation in 1776. We won. Now we have a new government which is taxing us more than the British ever did. If taking up arms was the right thing to do in 1776, is it also the right thing to do in 1786? Is it? You can see his point. But most of the colonial leaders, with some exceptions, did not agree because their counter to that was that well under the British system we had no voice at all there was we didn't have we had elected government only in the colonies but the British ultimately got the final say and we didn't have a voice there you couldn't run for the parliament you couldn't vote in parliamentary elections under this new system we have you can vote Daniel Shays if you don't like what the government of Massachusetts Doing, you have the option to run for office yourself. And if you get elected, you can change what they're doing, right? So, while rebellion and revolution might, is, the founders would say, obviously acceptable, only if you have no other alternative, which they would argue Shays did have. And ultimately, Shays' Rebellion doesn't succeed, but it does send shockwaves throughout the colonies and convinces many of the leaders and many of the, or the states at this point that we do need a stronger central government. We need some security here. So liberty versus order, which is going to be one of the big themes. You know, if we have any government at all, we would be totally free. You believe all is right. But what would life be like if everybody could just do whatever they want? Fun? In a way, it'd be fun if I could do whatever I want, but, it, but not so much if everybody else could do whatever they share. Yeah, yeah exactly. Nasty, brutish, and short. Obviously. So you need some order, but not too much. You know, places like China or North Korea, the streets are safer in Saudi Arabia. It's true. You know, why? Because they'll just kill you if you cause problems. But the cure at that point is worse than the disease, right? We like, have to balance these two things. So that's what the Philadelphia Convention will make need sought to do. Um, their original goal was to fix the Articles of Confederation, revise them, but they decided pretty quick that the Articles were a lost cause. So they just scrapped them and started writing a new constitution, went to work writing a new constitution. Um, this happened in the summer of 1787, one of the hottest summers it was said ever, up until that point, I guess, at least. Um, the the Proceedings happened in the State House in Philadelphia. All the doors and windows were closed and locked because outsiders weren't allowed to take part. How did gentlemen dress in 1787? Lots of layers, right? So, unusually hot summer. 
crammed inside with all the doors and windows closed, wearing layers of clothes. You think this was a fun place to be? And probably this did have some effect on the Constitution we ended up with. Now, this is one of those things that's really impossible to quantify. Like, we can't say how, but at the very least, it probably contributed to tempers, lack of patience, et cetera, et cetera, right? I mean, if you're a miserable, you're not going to be as nice. Probably right. smelly, too. Probably smelly, yeah, but, I mean, to be, to be honest, everybody probably smelled that. Or running water, you couldn't really bathe regularly, so. I mean, it's sponge bath, that's not as good. I mean, in the summer, you're still going to freak. Winter, not so much, because you'll be pneumonia. Oh, we have a pretty good idea. Okay, so goal was to create a new government that's strong enough to govern, but would also protect individual liberty. And James Madison is called the father of the Constitution, which is probably accurate. He is super influential on it. Um, but also, one of the other reasons we is is because much of the proceedings we have, we know about, are from his point of view. He kept detailed notes on the proceedings day to day. He's the only founder that did so. And everyone else was sworn to secrecy, so there's not any like written accounts as they happened that were published at the time. So we really get it from his point of view, which is going to affect how we see things, right? Um, but by all accounts, he is super influential. Now, worth mentioning a few things. I mean, he's probably the most influential one that you've actually heard of. Many of the other influential ones are less known. The ones you have heard of probably didn't contribute all that much. George Washington, president of the Constitutional Convention, but he felt, in his view, that as president, he basically would serve as a moderator. Like, president requires preside, right? So he presides over the proceedings, but he doesn't actually take a position on, I think he takes a position on one minor issue towards the end, but that's it. Otherwise, he tries to be neutral. Now, doesn't mean he didn't have some influence. As you know, a, moder a debate moderator can definitely influence the direction the debate goes and things like that, but probably not super influential. Benjamin Franklin at this time is, I think, 81 years old. He suffers from severe rheumatism. He has to be wheeled in. He falls asleep during much of it, mostly just tells stories. 81 is old today, probably much older at that time. Um, Thomas Jefferson is not there. He's in France, serving basically as an ambassador. John Adams also not there. He's in England, basically serving as ambassador. So, of course, Madison did write, I think he wrote a letter to Jefferson asking for advice, and Jefferson sent him about 80 books. And he probably read them all. Very good, probably probably read all right, what the delegates are. There are 55 of them, all men, no women. About two thirds of them were, no, two thirds, what would that be? 60% were lawyers, 8% were businessmen, six were planters, three were physicians, roughly half of them slaves. Interestingly, most of them were actually fairly young. Um, the average age of delegates there was 43, and that skewed upwards because, as I said, Franklin was 81 at this point. Um, it was secretive, uh, press and public were barred from attending, smoke-filled rooms, maybe. Um, convention rules were one state, one vote. So, how, who, if I didn't they write what they wrote? Well, what's going on at this time that's relevant to this in terms of, a, I don't know, intellectual, philosophical, scientific movement in Europe, John Locke, The Enlightenment. So, Regent Hobbes, humans are not good, was sort of his view of human nature. Most of the founders were more optimistic than Hobbes. They were more in the Lockean camp. Uh, Montesquieu, the French philosopher, who had suggested three branches of government as a way to uh, keep it in check. Most influential philosopher probably was a guy named John Locke, who was an English philosopher. He, he posited that 
humans had three natural rights. Anybody know what they are? Life, liberty, and property. Very good. Which sounds a lot like. Very good. I think Jefferson might have been inspired by that, for sure. So he also Locke. Locke really believed in the Enlightenment. Generally, believed that human nature is essentially good. Humans are basically rational. Uh, we don't have to assume the worst about humans. They don't, it wouldn't be so naive just to say all humans are good or all humans are good all the time. But basic assumption is humans are good and rational, which implies that humans are up to the task of self-government, right? If humans are not good and not rational, then we may need a king to control us, right? But if we're good and rational, we don't need that. We can do it ourselves. And so um, that is where sort of the Enlightenment where we knew the founders were coming from. Um, aspects of the British law also were influential. Magna Carta, which in Latin means Grand Charter. Um, don't want to get too much into this, but there is still a monarch in England today, right? How much power does he actually have? Pretty much nothing. Once upon a time, you know, the king or queen had absolute power. And over the centuries, that power has shifted away from the monarchy to the you know, parliament. You know, exactly that What's that? Like, when exactly did it It didn't happen all at once. It was kind of a gradual process. It began, the process began with the Magna Carta, though, because that's when it was declared that the king had to follow the same, had to follow the law just as everyone else did. So the implication there is the law is not simply what the king says it is. There is a natural law. And in common law, this idea that um, previous to the precedent is respected, like in court cases, typically, not always, but typically, precedent, like if there's a case before a judge dealing with constitutional law, the judge will look back and find a similar case, find out what the ruling was, and basically, typically uphold that. Not always, but usually. All right. So, controversies. Big states versus small states. How do we do representation in this new national government? Should we do it based on population? In other words, if you're Virginia and you have the biggest population, should you get more representatives than uh, the Georgia, I think, the smallest one population-wise? Should you? Well, if you're Virginia, you think so. If you're Georgia or North New Jersey, you don't think so. If you're New Jersey, you think we should all get more representation. The states should all get more representation. Of course, that means citizens within the states don't get more representation, right? Because if you're in a small state, you get the same votes as if you're in a big state. Effectively, people in the small states' votes matter more. So, how do we solve this? Well, Virginia plan wanted to do it based on population. New Jersey plan wanted to do it based on every state gets one vote regardless of size. And this was a long jam. It looked like it might derail the whole convention, but it was ultimately resolved, compromised, what became known as the Connecticut Compromise or the Great Compromise. How do we do it today? In the, in the government, national government, do states get representation based on population, or do they all get the same number of representatives? Yes. yes. Both is the answer. The House of Representatives is based on population. So bigger states get more representatives. Senate, everybody gets two senators regardless of population. So that is resolved. Next is those who wanted a stronger national government versus those who wanted a weaker national government, or nation versus state. Uh, Hamilton, as I said, is one of the advocates of a stronger national government. Generally, the founders mostly want shared government. They want state governments to continue to exist and have roles, but they also want a national government as well. But they disagree specifically on the extent to which each we should go in either direction. Um, so, ultimately, compromises here are that Congress is not granted general legislative power, but rather enumerated powers. And enumerated means written out. 
So if you read the Constitution, it says that Congress has the ability to declare war, make treaties, um, coin money, engage in foreign relations, et cetera, et cetera. It also says Congress has the ability to make to tax to provide for the general welfare and to make necessary and proper laws. Do you see any, I don't know, potential for controversy in those last two things? It's quite broad. It's quite broad. What does this mean? What is the general welfare? Who decides the general welfare? What are necessary and proper laws? If you, if you propose a law in Congress, presumably you think it's necessary and proper, don't you? I mean, you wouldn't think they only have the right to institute unnecessary and improper laws. So, the short answer, of course, much of what the federal government does today is not explicitly in the Constitution. There's nothing about Social Security in the Constitution, Medicare, Medicaid, National Parks, Public Education. None of these things are explicitly in the Constitution. But Congress would argue, and the courts have backed them up mostly on this, is that they would both fall under general welfare and necessary and proper. So they created jobs for the Well, the reason they, why did they use vague language here? Yep, that's part of it. They couldn't predict things coming in the future. But also, probably, they themselves didn't, couldn't agree on more specific, specifically. Later on, Madison is going to argue for a very narrow interpretation of this. So basically, only what's explicitly in the Constitution was some only the most obvious of exceptions. Hamilton's going to argue, well, the Constitution doesn't prohibit the government from doing it. It can do it. So they basically put the argument on its head. The Constitution says the federal government can do certain things and cannot do other things. But on most things, it says nothing. Everybody can agree it can do the things it says it can do and it can't do the things it says it can't do. But what about everything else? You could argue, well, if the founders intended this, they would have listed it among the things they can do. You can make that argument, except that you could just as easily make the argument that if they didn't want it, then they would have said they couldn't, because they did list things they can do. Founders didn't agree themselves on what this meant. So, surprise, surprise, we don't agree today on what it means either. People who wrote it couldn't agree. But, you know, this might be a flaw, but it's actually the genius of it as well. Probably too, because if they had been specific, more specific, the Constitution would have been stuck too much in 1787, which means how's it going to apply when we get to radio, TV, the internet, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? So that's also the genius of it. And of course, the worst aspect of it, slavery. So about half the delegates of the Constitutional Convention owned slavery. Um, most of them would have agreed, in principle, in theory at least, that slavery is wrong and that it's incompatible with a republic based on the idea of liberty, natural rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can't on the one you can't on the one hand say all men are created equal and, and have certain inalienable rights, and on the other hand, buy and sell them as property. So, what do you do? Well, basically, what the founders decided to do was hunt. We aren't going to solve this problem today. What we are going to do, though, is hope that future generations will be able to do this peacefully. Rational, which is totally what ended up happening, right? So, the most, the, probably the more charitable reading of this would be the founders maybe believed a bit too much in the Enlightenment. Like their view, if humans are basically good and rational, what conclusion 
What is the only real conclusion a good and rational person can come to when it's in regards to slavery? It's wrong. It's wrong. So their view is, as time goes on, people will become more enlightened, more educated, and more and more will come to this obvious conclusion, and they will solve this issue, right? But they may have put too much faith in the goodness of human nature. Again, this is the charitable, more charitable reading of the founders. I guess a less charitable one would be, you ever been to Monticello? Thomas Jefferson's home? Like you have? Would it surprise, you may already, probably already know this, but would it surprise you to know that he died heavily in debt? If you've seen his home, then you will understand why. Jefferson, early in his life, did make some efforts to phase out slavery, but he seems to have just given up pretty early on. Didn't do anything else. And over the course of his life, he had hundreds of slaves. I think he freed four of them, all members of the Hemings family. Wonder what was special about them. Anybody know? They were his children. They were probably his kids. Well, Sally Hemings was said to be, probably was. Paramore mistress doesn't really work because how much like consent is involved when you're literally owned by another person, right? So, I don't know. She was also said to have been his deceased wife's half sister. She had been originally owned by Jefferson's father in law. So she was, I think, three fourths wide and one fourth black. Jefferson's wife died when he was about 40, and he never remarried. Sally Hemings is his dead wife's half-sister. Maybe we don't know what she looked like. Maybe Roy would have some to this, I guess. <laughs> but we don't know. So what to do about this? They decided they threw some compromises in there. Slave international slave trade is going to be banned as of 1808, so 19 years after it's adopted. But the most infamous example here, the most infamous thing, would be the three fifths compromise. How do you count? We have to take a census periodically because that's how we determine the number of representatives each state gets, right? So that's why we do a census. How do we count? enslaved persons towards this number. If we count them, if we count them, ironically, that will only give the slave states more power, right? So if you're enslaved, you probably would prefer not to be counted at all. It's not as if you getting counted is going to result in you getting representation in the government. It's going to result in your owner getting representation. But ultimately, the decision was made that five slaves will count as three people for this purpose. And so, again, idea is that future generations, they'll figure this out, right? Surely this can be resolved. Reasonable, rational people can resolve this peacefully. Some of the founders lived long enough to see that that was not going to happen. By the 1820s, they seemed to people seem to be moving backwards in this. As I said, the founders, at least in theory, mostly would have agreed that slavery was wrong. It was at best a necessary evil. By the 1820s, people were arguing that it's a positive good. So, moving in the opposite direction is how Jefferson and the others hoped it would. And also, that some of the uh, George Washington did free his slaves. Most of them did. All right, so what do we have? Constitution creates a republic, not a pure democracy. Now, one of the things that annoys me is when people, and they're right, but it's also really pedantic. We're a republic, not a democracy. <laughs> yeah, 
you know, but this is like saying if someone prefers to sunrise, man, the sun doesn't actually rise. The earth rotates, it just appears there. It's like, okay. Yeah, you're right, but you're wasting my time. Because everybody knows this, hopefully. Democracy is really just shorthand, means government that elections are held, the public has a say, as opposed to an authoritarian government. There is no such thing as a pure democracy. No government in the world is a pure democracy. So if you're defining democracy that way, nobody's a democracy. If you're defining a republic, you know what? I mean, all the black like, 15 countries on planet Earth say they're republics. North Korea is the People's Democratic Republic of Korea. China is the People's Republic of China. I mean, do you think we're more in common with them or with the British who are not a republic? Okay, so now, we have become more democratic over time. A lot of people don't realize this, that you know senators originally weren't directly elected. They were appointed by state legislatures. It wasn't until the early 20th century that senators started being directly elected. President, as you know, is still not directly elected. They are elected via the Electoral College. They are indirectly elected today because all states give their electors to whoever carries that state. And originally this was not necessarily the case. Some states, state legislatures appointed electors, so voters really didn't have any say at all. So some more say now, but still not entirely. We have become more democratic over time through this, and also through the fact that franchise has expanded initially only white men who own property to all white men, to African American men for a while, but then that was taken away, then to women, then to African Americans again in the 50s and 60s. All right. Articles, Articles 1 creates Congress, Article 2 creates the presidency, Article 3 creates the courts, Article 4. Um, sort of defines roles of state and federal government. Um, Article 5 is about, tells us how to amend the Constitution. Article 6 establishes federal supremacy if there's an overlying jurisdiction. And also says there can be no religious tests for holding office in the United States. And Article 7 specifies how the Constitution gets ratified. Nine states have to do it for it to go into effect. So, we talked about, actually, we're talking about ambiguities, general welfare clause, necessary and proper clause. What do these mean? Well, that's why we have courts, right? Courts have been the ones who ultimately decided this because they are not clear. They're pretty broad. Now, the Constitution that emerged from the Philadelphia Convention did not initially have a Bill of Rights. It was simply the Articles. And this was controversial. Some people argued that we need to include a Bill of Rights. Others argued that if we include a Bill of Rights, this may further muddy the water because if we list a, explicitly give a list of rights that citizens should have, can we list every right that a citizen should have in a free society? No. So if we give an explicit list, that could be seen as saying, all right, these are the only rights you have. Make sense? So that was the argument. The Federalists supported ratification of the Constitution in its current form. Without the Bill of Rights, they included Hamilton, James Madison, John Jay, John Adams. Um, and, they, and Hamilton, Madison, and Jay wrote a series of 85 papers, known as the Federalist Papers, arguing in favor of ratification. And they're probably the best commentary on what the Constitution does and how it should be understood. Definitely they're taking a Federalist position on here though. Um, Hamilton argues for energy in the executive, which means a stronger presidency. Um, the Anti-Federalists opposed this and they argued against them and they wrote documents as well, the Anti-Federalist papers. Um, Jefferson and um, Thomas, or sorry, Patrick Henry were leaders in this regard. Ultimately, they do come over because we do get a Bill of Rights. And let's talk about that. First Amendment. Oh, five rights in the First Amendment, which might be a test question for some of you this week. 
What are the well? What are five? What are the five rights in the First Amendment? Free speech. Yep. Religion. Right. Press. Right. Assembly. Right. Fishing government. Very good. So, Second Amendment. Right to bear arms. Third Amendment. No quartering. What is quartering? Soldiers can't take over your house, basically. That was something that happened during the colonial period that the colonists hated. Fourth Amendment, no unreasonable searches and seizures. Fifth Amendment, no double jeopardy, protection against self-incrimination, eminent domain, and the right to due process. Six, basic trial procedures. Seven, jury trials for civil cases. Eight, no excessive bail, fines, or cruel and unusual punishment. Ninth Amendment, you have more rights than what we're telling you about here. <laughs> that is pretty much literally what it is. Thrown in probably because of the, fed, the Federalist argument. Um, ten, the power is not delegated to the U.S. or prohibited to the states or reserved by the states or the people. So those are the first ten amendments, the Bill of Rights. Those are the ones that we have and we take for granted. Now, having said all this, are all, the, are all these rights absolute? Are there limits on actually all of them? You do have free speech, but you can't commit fraud, right? You can't libel and slander. You can get punished for. You can't threaten somebody or harass somebody. That's illegal. So there are limits to all of these, but they are very specific and very defined. Of course. So we get those ten amendments. Then we get 17 more over the next 234 years. 11th Amendment, sovereign immunity. What is sovereign immunity? Can you sue the government? Generally not, unless the government gives you permission to sue it. I know that sounds weird, but, but the government has passed legislation enabling you to sue it in certain circumstances. If a civil right, if you're if you believe your civil rights have been violated, you can sue the government for that. Likewise, if you're a government employee, you have, you're entitled to the, have the right to the same workplace protections and that any other worker would. So if you don't get paid or you're unsafe conditions or something like that, you have the right to sue for that. Generally, you don't have the right to sue the government. But 12th Amendment. President, Vice President ran together on the same ticket because it wasn't originally that way, as you know. The one who got the most electable votes became president, the one who got the second became vice president. And that created a little problem in 1800 because Jefferson and Burr were effectively running for president and vice president respectively, but they tied in the electoral college, which means the House chooses the president by state delegation. I think it took 36 ballots before it was finally resolved. What bird would be president? I was just wondering the same thing. He was very close. He would have not been so good, probably. You know, what well, you know, what you know about Burr later on? Kills out there and Hamilton and Dougal while he was vice president. You can't imagine the vice president. Some of your tune, yeah. All right, so, um, yeah. Maybe fun fact, though, Burr couldn't, the vice president can't be fired because it's a, also an elected office, so, and so Jefferson was stuck with him. Until, like, you know, four, he could dump him and find another or anything. Yeah. All right, so that won't happen again, although there are still some quirks that, Nobody gets a majority of electoral votes, and the House does still choose the president, the Senate chooses the vice president. Hopefully that doesn't happen next year, because I have a feeling that could be very, very bad. All right, that was 1804. We go 61 years before we get another amendment. Then we get three over a five-year yeah, five period. Well, between 1865 and 1870. What had just happened and was happening? Civil War ended in 1865, and then we get the Reconstruction period shortly thereafter. So we get three amendments related to this. Um, we get the 13th Amendment, slavery finally is abolished. 
accept this punishment for crime of which you've been duly convicted. Fourteenth Amendment, citizenship rights and equal protections under the law for everyone born in the United States regardless of their state. So if you're born in the United States and subject to its jurisdiction, you are a citizen of the United States and of the state in which you reside. And, by the way, your citizenship rights and protections apply to the states as well as the federal government. Obviously, this was done to confer citizenship and rights on freed slaves. But this is actually one of the most consequential amendments in U.S. history because, you know, Brown versus Board of Education decision, Loving versus Virginia, Roe versus Wade, Oberfell versus Hodges, all of these have a basis in the 14th Amendment. 15th Amendment, right to vote can't be denied based on race. So we have those three amendments. And of course, if you know your history, you know that we didn't fully live up to these. At least until the 1960s, and maybe not even now. But they are aspirational, like most of these. Now, we go 43 years before we get another group of amendments, and these are the Progressive Era Amendments. 1913, we get the 16th Amendment, which for the first time, other than a brief period during the Civil War, we get an income tax, federal income tax. I'm sure all of you are very happy that that was adopted, right? Then, 17th Amendment, same year, senators are now directly elected. Then, the 18th Amendment, Prohibition and the 19th Amendment, right to vote can't be a bridge based on sex. Which was the, you may know the decisive state on that one, the one that passed the second vote. Since I'm asking, you probably can guess. Tennessee. Tennessee that passed the state legislature in Tennessee by one vote, by Harry Byrne, who later on lived in Rock. So, actually, a guy wrote a book about him. It's what, for Constitution Day? Two years ago, something like that. Maybe. All right, so 1920, we get uh, women get the right to vote. So we go, we get some mid 20th century amendments. None of them, I would argue, really that hugely consequential. But important. we get, we move inauguration day from March the 4th to January. 20th, right? And congressional sessions began January 3rd. Previously, votes had begun on March the 4th. This was to reduce the length of period after an election. Um, we get the 24th or 21st Amendment, which repeals the 18th Amendment, so no more prohibition. Well, in some states, it remains federally. And then, 18 years later, we get the 22nd Amendment, which says the president can only serve two terms or 10 years. Why was that passed, do you think? Roosevelt. Roosevelt served 12 years and had been elected to a fourth term. Would have served at least 16 had he survived. And we get a couple that in the 60s, Civil Rights Movement at this time, so we get some amendments related to that. One is in 1961, District of Columbia gets electoral votes. Voters don't elect presidents, states vote elect presidents. So if you don't live in a state, you don't get to vote for president. You live in Puerto Rico or Guam or somewhere like that. Or before the 23rd Amendment, the District of Columbia, it's not a state. But it was amended to allow residents there to vote for president. True story, you get representation in Congress if you live in the District of Columbia. <coughs> Not really. You get one non-voting delegate in the House. Puerto Rico, Guam, also get that. But you do get to vote for president, which is why you see, you know, cars from D.C. have no taxation or have taxation without representation. On there. License plates. And Twenty-fourth Amendment poll taxes are outlawed. Obviously, these were used to disenfranchise African Americans. Then we get the last three. The 25th Amendment, 1967, officially codifies the line of succession for president. So it makes it clear. President, vice president, 
both unable to serve, who becomes president then? You may know. Speaker of the House, good. Then who? Close. President pro tempore of the Senate, which is largely a ceremonial position. But their superpower is they're in a line of succession. After that, who? Secretary of State. And then they go down the cabinet post. Which is why during the State of Union address, there's always one cabinet member who's all in a bunker somewhere. In case so it codifies the line of succession. Also includes a section which governs what should happen if the president is unable to exercise their duties as president. You may know. Woodrow Wilson, towards the end of his presidency, suffered a stroke in office and was pretty badly incapacitated by it. And his wife basically served as president during that time. Uh, Post World War II, Cold War, the era of nuclear weapons, you can't really have that. You could get away with that back then, but not so much now. So there is a clause there which states uh, cabinet. Majority of the cabinet decides the president is unable to exercise their duties, they can vote to temporarily remove them and then the vice president. The president's got to worry about all kinds of stuff like that. Can vote. What president was it that like, had a certain kind of vote? Nobody knew that. Uh, I believe it was Rover Cleveland. Yeah, he went off on the ship and had that. Yeah, it was, I think there was like a reporter that exposed it. Was it like 10 years after? How did he end it? was a long time later. I know uh, uh, JFK was, had been injured in World War II and he was in a whole lot of back pain, so he was on some very high powered painkillers for it, which might have affected his abilities. Probably, I don't know, I'd say you probably can get away with that now, but I'm actually. All right, 26th Amendment, voting age is lower than 18. This was 1971. What's going on in 1971 that would be relevant to this? Getting off Vietnam. Right. So we're going to draft 18 year olds. Maybe they should get a say. The government. And then we go 21 years and we get the last amendment, the 27th Amendment, which if Congress votes to change their rate of pay, the rate of the change does not go into effect until after the next election. Fun fact this one was actually one of the original 12, which were proposed in 1789. Only 10 of them got ratified at that time, and they became the Bill of Rights. This was one of the two that didn't. They just floated around for years and years and years until the 1980s when a student at, I think it was the University of Texas, named Gregory Watson, found out about it and wrote a research paper for his political science class. And his professor, he argued in the paper that this amendment could still be ratified and should still be ratified. This professor disagreed and gave him a C for his paper. <laughs> so he started a letter writing campaign and ultimately convinced enough state legislatures to ratify and he got adopted. So as I tell you all, if you can get an amendment out of the Constitution, I'll give you an A for the class. <laughs> probably, probably should get started though because we have less than three months. All right. Will we add any more amendments? Probably at some point. I don't see it happening in the near future. But then there's also some things like what might be called the invisible constitution. Things which aren't written in there, but which are very important to, which we it's hard to imagine it's functioning without. What is a two-party system? Political parties not mentioned in the Constitution. Founders thought, really didn't think, well, thought that, you know, leaders should be partisan, they should compromise, they should um, work together for the good of the country. Probably worth mentioning most of them ended up joining political parties later on, so didn't really work the way they envisioned it would in practice. The Supreme Court can overturn acts of Congress. The Constitution doesn't say this. This comes from the Marbury versus Madison decision. But we take it for granted, and it's hard to imagine that not being the case, right? Um, Stare decisis, which I'm not a Latin, so I can Latin, probably correct my pronunciation for that. Stare decisis. 
What's that? Saudi Arabia pieces. Oh, very good. I should report you saying it. Um, so, standby past decisions, right, is what that means. Yeah. So, respect precedent. We have nine Supreme Court justices. The Constitution doesn't give a number. Nine is just the be accepted number. Peaceful transfer of power. And filibusters. What are filibusters? Talk to people to death. Although we don't, have, we don't actually do that anymore. We just threaten filibusters. Back in the good old days when you got up and talked for me. Strong Berman, old director for that, stood up and talked for 24 hours, 37 minutes. Think any of you could do that? I mean, if you're in, I guess, good shape, you could probably stand up and talk for that long. I mean, you might run into some. Probably that was repetitive. What's that? You get pretty repetitive after a while. Yeah, you can get a phone book. He didn't actually do that. The rest are probably. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I was going. Well, I think he dehydrated it still. Switch. Which, which, which would just create another problem, I would think, because that would make you weaker. Um, I mean, get creative with that, I guess. <coughs> All right. Not very many amendments we've had. So, how do we deal with what? Because it is kind of vague, and also because it was written mostly over 200 years ago, it's hard to say how the Constitution should apply to some of the things we have now. How does the Fourth Amendment apply to the Internet, for example? Is the Internet private or public? Or both? Or neither? Nobody has an answer? I said both. Both. Well, it probably depends. If you post something on social media publicly, then that's the same, I would say, as announcing it publicly. But what about your DMs? Private? Yeah, I think so. Well, I can think so. What about your search engine history on Google? Isn't all that still being decided currently? I think so. I mean, the only thing that Peter should worry about, if you have any problems with it, man, not really. I mean, uh, you ever like had some kind of symptoms that you Googled that you probably wouldn't want other, like, to share with other people? I'm sure pretty much everybody has at some point, right? So I was supposed to be dead. What's that? So I'm supposed to be dead two months ago according to Google. Oh, huh? yeah. And don't, yeah, I don't ever do that anyway. Whatever's wrong with you is cancer. I think John one of the things is if there's a suspected crime before the government does get you out. Yep. You do generally have to have a uh, warrant to see someone, you can check some, like, look at someone's email box or, uh, or see their search history or anything. What about, uh, there was a case, semi-local, but there was a guy in Rockwood who was accused of accessing child porn, basically, and part online, and uh, or whatever, I know they're not the same thing. Um, he, uh, the FBI had a warrant issued by a judge in Northern Virginia. He argued in his defense, and I'm not sure how it's been resolved or has yet, that that was invalid because the warrant would only apply in Northern Virginia and he was in Rockwood. How does that work? Depends if it was a federal warrant or a state warrant. Being FBI, it's federal warrant, so it should right. be good anywhere judges, in the country. Judges have jurisdiction districts, right? Yeah, but it's still a federal warrant. It doesn't matter what judge signed off on it. It should be good anywhere in the United States, just like a, just like a U.S. Marshal. U.S. Marshal can go in anywhere well, in the United States and arrest somebody. Yes, because they have a warrant for their arrest, but the standard for a warrant for an arrest is higher than the search warrant, though. 
deputy convicted, well, convicted of a crime or found like that be a fugitive, disobeyed a court order. His argument would effectively be that, and I don't think, this is again something the founders couldn't have envisioned, right? Because in their day, you commit a crime, yeah. You got your hand up? No, I'm stretching my hand, I'm sorry. So, I don't know. That's a hard question. Um, I mean, I don't feel bad for him, obviously. <laughs> this is precedence. What is it, hard cases make bad law? Like, you might not be sympathetic to person X, so we'll do this. But then you set a precedent which can be used later on against anybody else, right? So I don't know what the answer to that is. Or, I don't know, social media. How does the First Amendment apply on Facebook or Twitter? True. Actually, the answer, and this may change at some point, but as right now, the answer is Facebook, Twitter, these are private companies, which means that the people who own them have the right to govern what happens on their platform. So they don't want to, they want to delete your comment or whatever, they have the right to generally. Now, there's some exceptions, civil rights laws and stuff like that. Generally, that would be the answer. I don't know. Is that going to be how it's always going to be? Depends if they can be held accountable for what they said on the platform. Oh, you can be, for sure. Um, now, that, by what I said, what I said is you you can still be, like, if you post something libelous or slanderous on there, you can still be. You can be punished for that, for sure. If you harass somebody, theoretically, you can be. Um, harassment cases are online especially in person what would, what would James Madison say when he brought him back to life and asked him about asking these questions probably nothing because he wouldn't be able to get over the fact that you flip a switch and a light comes on right his answer though would be I don't know this is like asking us how, what, what should the law be on Mars? Beyond what we can conceive of today. But his response would be, we gave you an amendment process, so why don't you figure it out? Like we knew that times would change, there would be new technologies, there would be questions that we couldn't have thought of in our day, but that's why we gave you an amendment process, you figure it out. I mean, if we were rational, we would and we would probably decide how we want the Fourth Amendment to apply to the internet. We could add a constitutional amendment to clarify that, couldn't we? Or social media platforms or whatever. But I don't know. What does it take to amend the Constitution? Anybody know? Actually, there's two ways. Only one thing. Two thirds Senate vote. Close. You're on the right track. Two thirds House and two thirds Senate vote. Then three fourths of the states. That's the way. One way. And the way that it's the only way it's been done. The other way would be two thirds of the of the state legislatures would call for a constitutional convention. If they do, then a constitutional convention would be held, and that convention could then propose amendments, which then would have to be ratified by three fourths of the states. That has never happened. There have been attempts to, but none have been successful at this time. All of the pitfalls on that, too, is if you have a constitutional convention, they may just do like they did with the articles. Yeah, it's very, it'd be very risky to do that, I think. I think it's really risky. Yeah. It's the same as, I don't know, like, I live in a house that was built in 1948. If I like were built in a house today, would I build it the same way as it was built in 1948? No. But, so I should just go to my house that was built in 1948, change everything, 
So it'll be like today, should it not? Also no, because you start messing around with the foundation on the house, then you're probably gonna make things worse, right? So, I mean, the Constitution probably, if mean, we were writing it today, I'm sure we wouldn't write it the same way. Probably would be, wouldn't be, I think it's like 10 pages long. In our society today is writing thousands of pages long. I think the EU Constitution is that long. Or it wouldn't get ripped at all because we kind of suck. <laughs> or not mature enough to discuss things and compromise and things that you have to do. Frankly, I don't know if we could, I don't know that we're up to it, but frankly, too, we, we talked about the delegates to the Constitutional Convention, 55 men. Do uh, you think it would been a little more representative of the whole country? Like, say, women had taken part and African Americans had taken part. We would have ended up with a different constitution for sure. I mean, I'm sure something would have been done about slavery, probably. But either that or we just wouldn't have been able to agree and nothing would have happened. At this point, were Indians considered Americans? No, not generally. There may have been some that had citizenship. But actually, Native Americans didn't get like completely granted citizenship until like, 1920s. I think it was 19. There were some individuals that would have been, but, would have had it, but generally not. So, but I mean, you would. This is why I like to compromise, like the three fifths compromise, like these compromises on slavery. Well, I mean, it seems reasonable. If you're, it's a lot more reasonable to compromise someone else's rights away than yours. Seems to you anyway, right? Founders probably unintentionally allow this to persist too through the Senate, because the Senate means by the 1820s, 1830s, the free states' population was much bigger than the slave states' population. But thanks to the Senate, there was an equal number of slave and free states, which means they had this power. I don't think they intentionally signed it that way, but that did end up happening. Previous laws did too. Adams would have won in 1800 had it for that. Which I don't know. In that case, Jefferson was an objective man that president, I think. So, uh, points made. Thoughts, questions, concerns, comments? I guess the point I'm making is I don't think a lot of people say. I think we can tear it down, for sure. I don't know building things back up is a whole lot harder, so I don't know. And I don't know if we're up to it. Maybe we are, but we'd be better off if we want to change things and get the constant, trying to get the constant. Which is hard, for sure. But. Yeah, I mean, you can, again, you can tear things down. Most, re most revolutions actually don't succeed. Like, all long after we had our revolution, we had a revolution in France. How'd that go? Not good, no. So. Okay. All right, questions? Appreciate you all coming out. I will see most of you in class. I'll see all of you in the It's on the See most of you in class on Tuesday. And remember, test Tuesday, right?